And with that, we're going to go into our non-spoiler section and then take a break. So I want to go around this actual room for a little bit. Let's talk about The Witcher. Let's give a quick thoughts of what do you think about season one of The Witcher non-spoiler section? Rob? Well, I mean, first of all, seeing Henry Cavill, Cavill, however you pronounce his last name, shirtless, oiled, in a tub with suds all over him, it's on par if not slightly above seeing Charlie Hunnam shirtless. So I, I mean, it's tough to be distracted from the screen whenever he's shirtless. So it's an easy show to watch because he's shirtless all the time. Uh, outside of that, I mean, I think the show did a pretty solid job of introducing newcomers who are unfamiliar with the Witcher franchise, with, who are unfamiliar with the books or the video games to the world itself even though the world is so expansive and huge, I think they did an okay job of introducing some of the main characters. I think they did a pretty good job of introducing the locations that uh, everyone explores. And I think they did a, a pretty solid job of telling what, telling the story of what it means to be a witcher where you're a monster hunter for hire, but then there's also a deeper story behind Geralt where there's a love story going on. Um, he is uh, promised to a young princess that he has to find. And then, you know, subsequently after the show ends where it picks up with the games has to raise into a witcher herself. So I think they did a great job with a lot of that. They're, they're planting the seeds for a great franchise on Netflix and seeing as though it was so successful, the fact that the witcher became one of the most watched and talked about shows to be released this past year is huge for what can come from any video game franchise that ever wants to come to a television show or movie platform. I think the legend of Zelda was announced right afterwards, right after Netflix announced uh, how successful the Witcher was. And I actually have an article up on my site, wickedgaming.com talking about what we can expect from the success of the Witcher on Netflix and what other video game franchises we could see coming forth from this. I mean, I do, you, do you feel as though, sorry, but do you feel as though that this is the way to go? I know that we've seen countless video game franchise movies that just flop and fail and feel like they try to tell this story of this huge, expansive wor world in a span of two and a half hours. Do you think this could be the way to go with Netflix going, or you know, not quite Netflix, but a network trying to then stream multiple episodes and to kind of sh like elongate the story a little bit more and give it a little more breathing room. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. I mean, when I feel like the witch is a little different than a lot of other video game franchises, because when you boil it down, it originates from a book and that book was high fantasy and you see such success with game of Thrones. And I'm currently working through the wheel of time right now, which is going to be uh, a Hulu, I believe, or Amazon prime video or a television show whenever they finish uh, producing that. So when you, when you already have the basis of such a great high fantasy uh, genre with The Witcher or Game of Thrones or Wheel of Time or Lord of the Rings even, I feel like that implements very well into um, like a visual platform like Netflix or like a television show or a movie. I think it's easy to, to play those off. When you think of other video game like iterations in television and movies like the resident evils. The first movie was actually pretty good. The second one was also okay. And then everything from that was marketed straight out to China. They gave up on actually sticking to the resident evil roots of horror and they made it super action based Michael Bay explosions everywhere. They threw all of the fucking fans aside for a Chinese marketplace that gave them billions of fucking dollars every time they released a movie. So Fair enough. on that note, the Resident Evil franchise is getting rebooted again and it's going back to its core. <laughs> so right now I think is the perfect time for the video game movie television show revolution to take place. I'm not going to say it starts with the Witcher, but I think it's, and I think it's like the Flint, the spark from the Flint that's going to, you know, catch the kindling. That's going to start this whole thing. I, so you know, I, I mean, Hollywood's like now they're coming into a new decade, probably looking at the next cash cow. Um, you know, if the last decade was was Marvel, DC comics, 
you're like, I, you know, this is something that's new and exciting, but not too different that they can kind of like hold their hat on. Also, oh, Sonic. Oh, yeah, well, we don't know how that's going to be. That, oh, I'll, movie of the I'll, year. I'll pay to see that just because they went back and they redesigned him. I will support. This is Bob, Bob's fucking thumb of approval. I support good business practices and listening to your fan base. Good job. So I'll pay to go see that movie. But there's also the nostalgia factor that has fucking ramped up tenfold in the past couple of years with every old original franchise, even movie bases being remade and rebooted, even in video games. Like everything's being HD remastered. Everything's being rebooted. Now's the time for it to be not just remastered or rebooted, bring it to another platform. I think, I think this is the generation where it's going to be a lot bigger and a lot better than what it has been in the past. Cool. And with that, what we're going to do is we're going to take a quick break. Uh, once we return, we're going to be in the full spoiler edition of The Witcher streaming on Netflix right now. <laughs> Bathroom break for anybody? Uh, yeah, bring uh, the computer in with you. I need to get more water. I'll be right back. Yeah, do you think? That's why we said it's a break. <laughs> get the fuck out of here. Yeah, Rob, uh, I think that the... That's another good point. They're losing, bro. Get that shit out of here, Rylan. Um... What was I going to say? That uh, with like the, the rumor that the PlayStation 5 will be backwards compatible to 1992 with the, like the PlayStation 1, like there's no there's no re reason not to because like, all right, cool. You can play all the old games you like and also buy the remaster one because your TV got a little bit better since the mid 90s. There's no reason why the PlayStation 4 should wasn't backwards compatible. Well, yes. there's there's reasoning behind it, technical aspects of it, and the fact that Sony is so far behind when it comes to backwards compatibility compared to Microsoft, but the fact that they're actually making like the step forward to try to get ahead of it for the next generation of consoles is promising because Microsoft has dominated the backwards compatibility aspect of consoles for the past two generations. So I think like I'm skeptical because the PlayStation has had a bad past with this kind of stuff, but if they can implement it correctly with the PlayStation five, you know, spec wise, seeing as though it's going to be a more powerful console, they probably have the integration that's uh, necessary to allow for backwards compatibility. I think that's a huge fucking deal for them because they have a ton of exclusives that you can only play if you own a PlayStation one or a PlayStation two, or th it was like one out of every 15,000, games yeah. that was act that was you could access through or well, like a fucking playstation vita i'd be i'd be pissed if i couldn't go back and play red dead redemption 2 that i still haven't played yet on my playstation 4 when the playstation 5 comes out oh they'll definitely be able you'll definitely be able to do that no but that's what i mean like i i would be pissed because like you know with nintendo you can't because they make a different cartridge for every single system yeah, that's all proprietary though. They do that on purpose. No, I yeah, no, I know, but like it's it's so brutal with a uh, with a disc based like an optical disc based system when it's just like it's a disc. Just yeah. make it something similar. So they could do what Microsoft does, where you could. So Microsoft already has in place you could do remote play with your Xbox consoles on your PC because it's all it's all Windows exclusive. You can connect through either one of them. So, you know, Microsoft, again, is a PC-based company that came from PC first and then created the console. So Sony is already on the back foot when it comes to that kind of shit. But, like, I, it can't be that difficult to implement. And I, I think they'll be able to pull it off. I think, it, I think it'll be easy enough. Uh, if you own PlayStation 4 games now, you should be able to play it on a PlayStation 5. This is, again, me speculating because I don't know for sure. But if not, they'll... they'll at some point in the near future after release have some form of backwards compatibility where you can access your previous like PlayStation 4, PlayStation 3 library. I mean, they, they should just do what, what Apple does for, uh, what's it called? Like iCloud Music Library, where, you know, it just reads an encryption key and then it just goes back off their server and you're essentially streaming the game from, from Sony rather than playing it off the disc. We talk so, in Stadia? So... <laughs> worse well i can't say worse than stadia, stadia is uh, bad yeah stadia but 
the so infrastructure's not there for Stadia yet. No way. Well, not sorry, not streaming it, but like essentially using the initial encryption key on the disc right. just to generate your copy that you download from like from the PlayStation Store. Yeah, but even with that, you you have to be it, the information has to be pinged from the server in which that's stored to your location, so you are essentially streaming it. And PlayStation tried doing that with the PS4 and PlayStation Live, and it did not go well. It was almost impossible to use, and you couldn't play any competitive game because the latency would be so mm. high, and like the frame and shit, it, it, it just you couldn't do it. So again, with the next fucking console and the hope that it's going to be more powerful and you know the assumption that if you're going to playstation 5 you're going to have a more powerful system it should be more you know compatible with stuff like that but again but like sony just doesn't have the background for it yet microsoft has fucking two decades of background for it but sony does it hey bob uh do you know if uh on xbox game pass is there a quality lim- uh like limit to what those games will run or are they PC optimized? Uh, I would ass- I don't know. So if you are streaming through the like Microsoft Like Final Dashboard, Fantasy 15 is coming out for it soon and yeah. that's optimized to go to 8K on a PC. Mm-hmm. But if you're playing it through Game Pass, I don't it know. Go that high. So there's two different ways to access it. You could go into Microsoft. You can link your Xbox account to your Microsoft, which I would suggest anybody who does, who has games cross PC and console should do. Um, I think you can access, if the game is supported on Microsoft, which it would be at that point, I think, I don't see why it wouldn't, but if you're yeah. streaming it through like the Xbox dashboard to your PC, I would assume it's still native to the console that you're streaming it from. Gotcha. But I don't know. But I don't know for sure. All righty. Cool. Ch- look into the Microsoft Store and see. Yeah. Cause I know you. Can, yeah, because I know you can um, log into your Microsoft account in the Microsoft Store, and I think if you already have stuff on your Xbox that's compatible with Windows, I think you can play it just through the Microsoft Store. And I think you can bypass the whole uh, streaming aspect of Xbox One to PC. Yeah, I downloaded the Game Pass uh, launcher for PC. I just haven't bit the bullet yet. I'm just waiting for content to be on there that I want to try to play and try out. Yeah, Game Pass is... <clears throat> like, I gave my Xbox to my girlfriend, and she has game... I got Game Pass for her, and she... she'll have fucking video games for the rest of her life at this point. <laughs> And we are back. back. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Give us a heads up, Warren. I know, dude. What a fucking host you are, bro. Wow. Take this. Take over. Do do that three. All right. You've been excommunicated, Warren. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my gosh. He was running the ship as the dictator. (laughs) I'm going to step in. Here comes here comes the fucking United States free in the countries. Let so, me step in real quick. So another Hope white guy takes something from a black guy? Oh, oh. Well, and uh, we're cutting the stream there, guys. Uh, <laughs> I hear the Twitch cops coming. Oh, oh fuck, I'm banned. All right, we're moving a mixer, guys. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, the lowest wild, wild west of the streaming world. Yeah, no shit. And we are back. And we are the Down in Front Podcast. We are in our spoiler section for The Witcher. We have our special guest, Dr. Bobbert, here hanging out with us. We are going to be talking about everything and anything about The Witcher series in on Netflix right now. We will also be probably talking about The Witcher video game. I'm not sure how much detail, but let's let it ride. We're going to kind of toss it into a couple of different sections, as we usually do. So we're going to talk about the characters in the story of this actual sort of film or this actual show itself. And then we're going to end with some lasting and final thoughts and conclusions and what we'll be reviewing next week. So I'm going to toss it over to the delicious mouth of the South. Brylan, talk to me about the acting and characters of Witcher on Netflix right now. All right. Yeah. Speaking of tasty things, um, there's a lot of good in this uh, series and I like how they um they found a way to make a show that felt very video gamey 
but also at the same time be like a very interesting fantasy drama as well. And I think when it comes to characters, definitely the standout is Henry Cavill as Geralt. Um, he, I mean, just, I have never seen anybody like capture a video game character, much less a character from a fantasy story kind of in the way he does. And it's like, he knows how to like, just balance this line between, let me give you this fictional character story, but also let me actually wink at you and break the fourth wall every once in a while to actually just tap into that nerdiness of what all like Witcher game players would feel of being Geralt the Witcher. And this guy gets through half the show by saying, fuck and just grunting all the time and it's awesome it fits the character perfectly and i like that he is kind of like he is a mandalorian style character he's walking into the bar and he's having a sit he's sitting down minding his own business and either he goes he finds a way to find trouble or trouble finds him uh it's just happens to him he talks to his horse he loves his horse and his horse is probably his best friend uh, and even though people want to hang around him and everything, he really doesn't want to be around people for the most part. And it's, uh, it's just really awesome how, uh, Henry Cavill is able to capture just all these like nuances about Geralt that reminds me of the video game, but also is able to, uh, just bring his own little twist on that makes it his character too. And it, it just baffles me how, like what type of person how much do they care about what they do when they look at like the fitness they put them through to get to Superman level? They said, no, that's not, that's not swole enough. And they had 20 more pounds of muscle for Geralt. I'm like, the dude's nuts <laughs> and he's nuts in the right way. And it's cool that he's a fan of this content and everything, because you could definitely see he cares about making this character work and he definitely makes it work. Was the, what, it was Geralt this jacked in the video game? I mean, you it, can make. I mean, you have some sliders. Superman I mean, nothing, isn't as jacked as Henry Cavill. Yeah, I mean, but I get, I, but I get why Superman needs. I mean, they put a skin tight suit on him in Superman. I'm like, okay, cool. Yes, I understand they did. We want, I, we, I understand we need to see the muscles, but they did it. They the, did it one better with the Witcher, and they removed the. Suit. Yeah, I was gonna say, <laughs> like, oh, I might get. You could you could be skinnier to play Superman because they could just digitally edit all that stuff. So allegedly, um, Henry Cavill actually gave the costume designers for The Witcher a really hard time because his muscles were so big that he constantly wore through the leather of his outfits, <laughs> and they had to make several just to film the eight hours of content oh for this movie. God, I would love to buy some of that fucking worn out leather. <laughs> oh my god, I will fall asleep with a teddy bear stitched together from Henry Cavill's shredded Witcher costume rags. <laughs> shredded chaps. <laughs> All right, uh, Brian. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, we, I, the, we could all, we could spend four hours talking about Henry Cavill, and oh, I, yeah. I, we will as Let's. soon as, as soon as this podcast <laughs> is over, we're going to be talking about Henry Cav Cavill's leather daddy Jesse Rand. Um, but, but <laughs> beforehand, uh, Brian, you bring up a good point where, like, usually a character this boring, like in an abstract, a character whose eighty percent of his words are just less than three syllables it is a terrible character um yeah. in the hands of a lesser actor that person it's maybe like Geralt's like this tortured soul either he kind of just exists he's he's the definition of a video game character um which is why i think that they've had such a hard time adapting video games to other medias um whereas like for some reason it just freaking works with him like yeah it you know it the the subtle stuff he does to kind of like shift his body around to like portray either unease or just you know everything else without being vocal or even overly dramatic with his body it's awesome yeah absolutely and um i think it's uh, really cool like uh i think in the video game like what is like one of the most entertaining things you do you just wait for Geralt's beard to grow out and then you shave your, you go and say, Oh, let me just shave it in a different way and stuff. And that's like one of the things that you were a player would routinely go to, or the player just lets the beard grow until it's just all haggard and scruffy. But 
it's interesting like that small like type of minutia, minutia when it comes to a video game character that that's pretty much like one one of the small but major aspects of what that character is and be able to pull a actual interesting character out of that video game avatar for the lack of anything i think is a really impressive feat and i think it definitely takes someone that's a a really amazing actor to make that happen Yeah, I gotta say that I really love the fact that they were that Henry Cavill was able to bring The Witcher from the game to life in such a mean, like a meaningful way. But also, at least from the anecdotal evidence I have from people I've talked to in my circle who aren't video game players, it was a negative for some people that Cavill's character was so uh, like quiet and like not really. I guess they felt like he wasn't really interesting enough as the protagonist because of that. And for, for me and all of us here, like it's good because we know who 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 Geralt is, at least in the games. I can't speak to the books, I haven't read them myself. But um but I do think that it was a bit of a turnoff for some people who weren't game fans. And I think the rest of the show around Henry Cavill kind of saved them and kept them kept them involved and focused. Yeah. I, I feel like I feel like there's an argument to be made against that. Like I bought the game I bought with The Witcher Three Wild Hunt after I watched after I binged the entire fucking thing in one day and the aspect of being around this character Geralt for a hundred plus hours as you play through the game, you're obviously going to get more dialogue from that experience because it's tenfold times more than what you're watching in the show. You're getting eight hours worth of, sorry, you're getting like three hours worth of Geralt because there are other characters in the show that take the spotlight for a little too long. In my opinion, but that's three hours or at max eight hours compared to a hundred plus hours in just the Witcher three and then another 200 plus hours from the Witcher one and two. So that's 300 plus hours total that you are getting with a character. Of course, you're going to get more quote unquote character from that person as you're playing through the game compared to eight hours of it. Yeah. yeah honestly, I, I don't like that argument. The, yeah. And I, I also cannot find a way where people will find, Geralt a boring character especially after that episode with the Striga like that entire story is pitch perfect Witcher like yeah. when it comes to its mythos and everything uh, but it also shows like the Witcher's not like this one note character he's not going to just barge into random bars and start slicing heads off he's also going to use his brain to figure out how do we actually how do I take out this monster because the, one of my favorite things about the Witcher's uh creatures and everything they're usually manifestations of greed and human uh these evil these evil parts of humanity that just manifest because someone did somebody wrong or cheated on someone's spouse and it's really it's interesting to see that they use that as the basis of how these monsters are created and i mean the string which is essentially a giant monster supported fetus um when like the tension they build when that guy is repeating like the phrase or the story behind it and as soon as Geralt figures out what he has to do in order to beat it and he just goes fuck and grabs three of those potions and chugs them and breaks them down i was like i'm totally sold in until this series is gone as henry cavill as Geralt because he perfectly sold that whole fight and just showing, like, one way to beat a monster is not necessarily just to kill it. It's also to deprive it of its home and things like that. To actually go through these little curses and go through these little um, spells and everything to actually make things happen as well. You know, I it's funny because I was thinking about how a lot of people were concerned about the pacing on it. Um, and then immediately I'm like, no, those, those people have valid, valid arguments because one of the brilliances behind Geralt is that he starts off as this, well, you're supposed to be this emotionless, just killing machine, right? You, you go from village to village and all you do is people pay you money and you, you kill things for them, uh, monsters. Um, there, he makes it a major point to say, I'm not going to get involved in, like your silly human politics, as long as someone is paying me at the end of the day. Um, and 
I think we need to live in that character first for a little while. So uh, I'll be honest, I've, I think I'm like, I don't know, 50% of the way through The Witcher 3. And so you start to see like little cracks in, you know, what makes him an interesting character. But you have to live with that mindless killing machine at first. Um, and so ne Netflix has said like, hey, we have a seven year plan for this one, right? Oh, nice. uh, which probably means three, but, <laughs> you know, at least they, they got a, a, an arc. And so, you know, I, I was okay with... I'm okay if they took their time and didn't explain anything because I trust that they will actually get to it and explain it. That being said, I think they could have done a little bit of lore building at first because someone noticing him slamming those potions probably would have no idea what they are and what they do to him. Yeah, and that's the thing that I feel like we need, lore building. I that's thing that I feel we need to keep in mind is that a lot of our input uh, in terms of our at least how we're affected by the show relies on the fact that we have a lot of background knowledge even if we didn't play every single way straight game start to finish just in terms of what fantasy stuff like that is and i feel like for people for audience members like obviously this is a really successful show a lot of people tune in and watch it watched it but i feel like like i mentioned uh you know over uh, when we first started this the show doesn't hold your hand as an audience member and i feel like the audience that netflix can bring the witcher to uh is much wider than the audience for the video games or even the books and so i feel like it could have they could have done done better in that regard i mean but even going off of that, Mocha, I feel like here in this room, I may have the least amount of knowledge of The Rich Witcher at all. Like, I've never played any of the games. I didn't even know there were books. I'm just coming in completely blind and going into this film, uh, this actual TV show. I still was able to pick up on all these things. Could be because, like you said, my knowledge of fantasy, high fantasy, I understand. I, I played other video games that you need potions and whatever you can to kind of boost your power up. But even going off of what you were talking about, Brylin, I just like in this film, or excuse me, in this TV show that it's sometimes missed and even video games definitely missed in movies is that he's giving a lot of good motivations of why he has to go and um, fight this trigger. Why is he actually kind of doing this? It's not because he has a feeling for it. He's trying to either kind of go back and right a wrong of what a witcher's task is supposed to be. And if a witcher were to die and he has no idea what happened to this witcher, finds out they were actually kind of hiding it and they he's trying to clear the, the witcher's guild name of he actually did, didn't run away. He actually died from it because something actually bested a witcher. I like how they actually kind of put in those particular kind of motivations for characters in this actual story, which made me want to watch it even more. So I, I liked, I, I agree with you, but at the same time is there was so much talk. There's so much exposition. There was even one point where Jaskier even says, oh, look at me, I'm just saying expedition, which I thought was hilarious. <laughs> there was so much exposition of what a Witcher is by everybody else talking about it in the show so that if you it. just weren't paying attention of what it is, I, I'd rather you just give me the story now and not show me the lore and have everybody else dialogue, which makes sense on why we need to figure out who this character is. It makes it more for an impactful watch now than giving something that's a super slow burn for some for a TV show to try to explain what the Witcher world is first before then now giving us a story of what is that, what exactly he's doing. I Man. like the way that Netflix ended up doing it here. You know, I, I completely agree with you. And I think part of, like, I liked it better that they did subvert some expectations and didn't have to explain it all. Um, I think I'm also a little bit used to, like, video games having tutorial levels. And so it's like, oh, yeah, duh. Like, so, so you know, the, the whole thing with, like, the potions, there's something called vitality. And so the more he takes of those, he, like, basically damages himself. So the yeah. fact that he had to take three was like really detrimental to his health. Um, and so, I don't know, they could have played it up a little bit more of like to, to show the gravitas of the situation. Um, I, I think they did. I, I think what Warren's saying makes a lot of sense, but I also think that it show there's a lot to show from the fact that after a lot of people watched, like after so many people watched the show and it was so successful, the number of people who went out and bought The Witcher 3 afterwards was more than the amount of people yeah. that bought the game upon release. I was one of those people. I'm included <laughs> in that. That just shows that even if they're, you know, leaving things a little open-ended and they're not, you know, coming straight at you with, 
this is what a witcher is. This is what the witcher does. Hi, I'm Geralt and I kill monsters. It's there's it it leaves it open enough to make people interested for one a second season and the possible you know subsequent seven other seasons that they want to do with this or two to go back play the video games that people are now doing i'm personally doing or three go read the books because it's all based off of everything together granted the show is more based off of the books and the game comes shortly after the show yeah the show the they're, show's based off the books. They're co the game comes adaptations. Like the books are, from what I can, from what I've read, they they basically view the books as gospel, and then like the video game is an adaptation of the book. Yeah. And yeah. they're like OVAs. Yeah. I guess ultimately, I don't work. mind a little mystery in a TV show, like any movie. I'd rather you not just hand me the the answers to it immediately, especially if. Netflix has a big story that they want to talk about. I'd rather slowly build up. I've seen this and I've seen this not only in high fantasy, but I've seen this in just normal stories in any particular story that's there and how a story is crafted. If you give too much of the lore, the fantasy, or the, excuse me, the mystery away early on, you tend to lose even the entire character of Siri, which I know you want to talk about, Brylin. If you give too much of that away at first or even up front in the first few or four episodes, you're going to tend to say, well, why is this? Imp- oh, I, I don't care, sort of thing. Yeah. So, and it's a. Uh... Oh, go ahead, Blue. Oh, I was going to say, I, you know, the, the big spoiler on this one was like the multiple timelines. I wish they pushed that back. I was taken aback. I, I didn't see that one coming at all, and I kind of loved it. Um, it was I, fun, wish we, I, thought. I wish we found that like way later in the season. Yeah, well, some people didn't even notice Real until awesome. the last yeah. episode. So, <laughs> so it's yeah, not know, like, like people... it's not like every yeah, that's the thing, Blue. And it was something that oh, really? people didn't they... even know. No, it wasn't very that fourth clear. Episode was wicked obvious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but it, up on but, episode four, but, you but I know a lot but, of people who didn't until seven. Really? Yeah, it, it was pretty really? because it was an easy like flashback, and it was like, oh, okay, yeah. this is like a normal flashback. Not realizing even in episode one, it started with multiple storylines, yeah. just how it's normally. It would start a long, long time yeah. ago. So I, I I do appreciate that because that was another way that I'm like, oh my god, this is really good. I'm all for any sort of like weird sort of storytelling, and you mess with the time. That's um, why. See, that's why I thought the pacing was just so far off. Like. They jumped around between time periods where, you know, all you need is a tiny little subtitle at the bottom 10 years, pr- 10 years earlier, but they never did that. So they left, they left it ambiguous for the watcher to try to, you know, determine. But then like on top of that, they had three entire fucking episodes of watching Yennefer go from ugly hunchback of Vengerberg yeah. to now she's fucking naked having sex with Geralt and like I'm kind of watching Geralt a little bit more than I'm watching her but I'm still kind of watching her too oh there's no need to be ashamed on that one we were all oh, watching no. <laughs> America's watching like Geralt shame. <laughs> <laughs> that's a sh- face of satisfaction exactly. um no I agree with you uh Rob because here's the thing the so the multiple timelines is cool and it's a neat yeah. twist it's a neat twist but it really does kind of feel like a M. Night Shyamalan kind of like oh what a twist thing because it wasn't it wasn't really necessary like it didn't make the story as itself cooler by finding out later on that the things that we were seeing weren't all happening at the same time and then it just caused me to put, like me personally as someone who like was enjoyed it to put a lot more effort than I would have wanted to thinking of every time I saw a scene okay where does this scene fall in relation right. to everything else I've seen and I agree like right. I don't think that was worth the mystery of it of not knowing what happened I think just telling us when things were happening would have been uh, better especially because again this is the first introduction to this whole exactly. world and it's a huge world with a bunch of sh- of like lore based stuff that uh you know the viewers aren't going to understand if you go into it and i agree with you warren you don't have to spell out every single thing but i do think that it would have been uh more more effective if they just let you know off the bat well one thing i enjoyed about the timelines was i think it really benefited uh yennefer's story for the most part um but uh, i did want to just bring up that um uh, the actress that plays Jennifer, Anya Charlotra. Um, we haven't, I haven't really seen her from anything. I don't think any of us have really seen her in anything. But uh, I think Jennifer has the best storyline throughout this entire series. And I think when, when they do drop that, oh, some of these things have happened in the past that we've already seen, and they've happened further in the past that we actually uh, think, it actually 
helps her character grow a lot later on and i think it's actually really interesting i think her i think um anya does a great job as jennifer because when she was first cast i was just like hmm, she's kind of not who i would picture as jennifer she seemed like kind of young for a jennifer in my in my opinion but uh but i think she makes it work a lot and you can actually see that change in her just attitude towards things and her emotions over time that makes her go from this young little half elf farm farm girl that's twisted and everything uh to a very confident and powerful sorceress by the end so um i thought she knocked it out of the park as jennifer and i can't wait to see what she continues to do with that character I mean, char- character-wise, I think they cast everybody perfectly. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. Henry Cavill as Geralt, there will be another... There will never be... He's like the um, fucking... Ben Affleck as Batman. N- n- not that one. <laughs> uh, who the fuck am I thinking that played Logan? Oh, oh Hugh, uh, Jackman. Uh, Hugh Jackman. Hugh Jackman. He's the Hugh Jackman of Geralt. Mm. There will never be another Geralt after the performance that he put on. The one major character that I think they did absolutely fucking wrong in this show was Triss Marigold. I was just about to say that. Was Triss. Triss is a translucent skinned, bright red hair, beautiful woman. And they did her so wrong and they didn't give her the time of fucking day. And she was only in like two episodes and with a total of like six lines. I think the casting was probably a little too far off. And I think the fact that they made the role so minor was also a huge misplay on their part. I think she's a major character in the games. I'm sure she's a major character in the books. She's someone that needs to be like up in front for the next season, in my opinion. Well, yeah. here's another, another thing. I, I know that you can't add every single character's this. like origin story into like right. the first season. Uh, but I think um, hopefully uh, – that the casting isn't wrong because she doesn't give get much to work with at all. Right. And but it's important it, it's to like, cast that role. Now. I mean, it's important to make sure that character is set to be important. And I think they do fail on that because it is her, her moments are kind of purposelessness right? and they don't really impact the overall story as just like another sorcerer that Jennifer knows. Um, but uh, I hope next season they do, build out her character and give her those moments that will make her Triss that we know uh, from you know, the games. So I'm, I'm okay with her not being translucent, but they should definitely give her the actress a red wig because like that's yeah, consistent yeah. in her the books and red-ish. the game. Like, it was, yeah, no, yeah, it, it was like red. It was like, it was like super burnt brown. It was just brown. <laughs> oh, it it was brown. Just, yeah, I was like, what are you talking about? I mean, maybe the, maybe they the were one. trying to say that after she got burned at the end that maybe she'll no, turn. No, 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 okay. no, no, no. No, that's not it at all. <laughs> In the games, she, she's she, a ginger. Just, it is just bright red hair. And and she's like, described that red. she's described that way in the book too. Yeah. Yeah. So, um like, yeah. they give her a wig. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the things about this this show too that I feel like uh I, I wish like you were saying earlier, Rob, I wish it was 12 episodes long um, yeah. because the show for the maybe, maybe like the first six episodes or so, they kind of drive home the point that the main characters, like the real characters that matter are uh, Geralt, Yennefer, and Ciri. Yeah. When in reality, there are a lot of characters that have a lot of impact, impact on a huge story. And I feel like none of that really comes across until you get to episode seven and they do the uh, like the siege of, of that castle. When all of a sudden you're realizing, oh, here's like here's Triss, she's back. I thought she was only going to be a one-off for that last uh, for when she encountered Geralt. I didn't think that she was going to be coming back, but here she is, and here are all the other mages, and you know the uh, the leader of uh, was it Philgard? What's the name of the Nilfgaard? Nilfgaard. No, Nilfgaard. yeah, like uh, like these are all characters. We don't need that. Him. Uh, who was their commander in the field then? Was that not the leader? See, I couldn't that tell because I couldn't. Hunt, I, thought. I couldn't even tell what that what that was, and I feel like there's so much like. So they haven't going on. they haven't quite explained that. And I think due to the fight with the Doppler, like there's something more going on with that guy that I don't know where that's going to pay off. And that's just I haven't read the books. I I haven't beat the game. Like I don't know the I I believe his name comes up, and I believe it's not the king of Nilfgaard that you meet in the third Witcher. Who his that name, guy is really important. It's, it's definitely not. His character's name is Kahir, I think. Kahir? 
I don't think that's, I don't think that's the Nilfgaardian king. No, that's like he's him, not the king. He's like he was Black something. Knight at one point, but Kay here was the main um, was the main general, I guess, yeah, of the Nilfgaard yeah. army who yeah, killed Calanthe's uh, husband. I can't remember his name, but the one who gets his identi- king. identity stolen. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. no, I know who we, I know. I know that, but like the the king of Nilfgaard isn't that guy. At least at the end of this whole, okay. so like correct. they still haven't yeah. introduced that person and that person's a pretty major character well um, okay good that, that that just goes to show like nilfgaard is a major threat it seems like all the characters within nilfgaard it seems so what I, here's a good way for me to kind of condense my whole my whole issue with this show which again is a show that i liked it feels it feels like they're trying to do like netflix's game of thrones but without like like really exploring all the different parts of the world like it's as if game of thrones only focused on three characters until like yeah. the last episode of a season and then yeah. suddenly said all the other characters. I 100% characters. agree with that actually, yes. Well, but we're not going to go mean, to every single place in the continent. You well, don't need to, but you can do season. it better. You can, also, you can but, absolutely do it better, Brian. Like, yeah, but like, that's why you add more episodes. I mean, yeah. that's, why, that's why you don't get Skellige and you don't get uh, like the, I think there's like a red like army somewhere. Ro- yeah, those yeah. Rodania. Rodania. Yeah. Rodania yeah. I'm not saying, places, Brian, so. that every single thing that, that, get, that happened in the books has to be equally represented in the story. I'm just saying that they could oh, have no. done a better job of fleshing out what they were doing, and I feel like oh, that could like have been done with 12 or... episodes. Well, locations, yeah. the people, why, like, here's a great example. Uh, Fringilla wound up being a really significant character later on, because after the yeah. time skip, she's the main evil mage for, or the main mage, court mage for Nilfgaard. Yeah. Um, when we were in the early parts where it was Yennefer like growing up in the uh, mage school, the only real scene we get with Fringilla is when she gets her hand turned into that like gross little claw thing. But we don't get any sort of dialogue from her, any other scenes with her, which is fine because it was about Yennefer, but she's a major character later on. So when she showed back up, I was like, oh, that must be the one black girl from the beginning of this story. That must be her now. <laughs> That's cool. I wish I, like, I wish I, I wish I knew, knew that then that she had, that she mattered in some way. Yeah. So I woke well, I can't agree with you more. Yes, the one black girl. It's almost February. I can't agree with you more. That's going to be there, <laughs> especially the fact that the the stuff that I was latching onto at the Battle of Sodden was, um, Flangilla kept talking to to Saya and she kept talking to Yennefer about there's all this dark magic that the um oh shit i'm gonna forget the name of the mage place I, it'll come to me um there's a lot of dark magic and stuff that they don't teach you they don't talk about it's not taboo there's nothing about light and dark a lot of the stuff that we've seen in so many other pieces of work a lot of the stuff that she was talking about was like yes this is this is very true there's nothing about light magic or dark magic it just is what it is and it's how you interpret it going through i loved everything I just was confused. I was happy that a black girl gets something. I'm like, hell yeah, there we go. Uh, but we got a lot of diversity in the show, so I'm oh, not yeah. gonna. I'm there not was gonna plenty of diversity, yeah, definitely. But yeah. at the same time, I was like, how is she now somehow more powerful than Tasaya? Right? How is she more powerful than all these other mages? Because so, you uh, didn't give her the chance in the show, right? You didn't give her a chance to do anything, and all we see that. Um, when Yennefer has her in, uh, entire transformation, she, uh, Frangilla was just snubbed, who was supposed to go to Aiden. Fr- Frangilla was just snubbed and kind of went to the side and was like, there you go. Now, the only thing I can think of, Mocha, and I had a rewatch of this again, this entire season. The only thing I can think of is that if Frangilla's grandfather or father who is one of the head on the board of the place in Artuza? There we go. Uh, he's basically one of the one of the leaders, along with Shegabor, along with Tasaya. If he was also in <laughs> cahoots of teaching her some of this black magic stuff and was really kind of share some of his power with her, and that's why she's strong. I don't know, but well, it definitely made it seem like could, something else is happening here. Could, yeah, blue. So I think they they mentioned this, but. For 15 and, minutes at max. It's blood magic. Yeah, so there's this it's like event magic. that happened. Basically, yeah. it was like standard Middle Ages until this event. What was it? The congruence? Yeah. Um, and so, conjunction. And so, conjunction. conjunction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and so, uh, congruence is from Thor, too. Um, oh, no, it's convergence. no, that's the convergence. Yeah, it's, it's, oh, I don't know. Congruence is no from idea. math, but keep going. I have no idea. They're all uh, so, so, basically, like, 
they didn't do a great job saying this. So there was this moment where magic was thrust into like basically standard middle ages. Um, and that's where you get the monsters from basically monsters escape from another universe um, with along with like a magic entity. It's almost like if we were gamma ray burst at the same time as like, I don't know, Lovecraftian horrors were emerged from the depths. Um, and so that's why witchers kind of came to be. And they basically like man's fight back against this, like this magic also there's like so they've referenced chaos they did a good job explaining that actually i, th I think i got a better yeah. grasp of that in the show than i did in the game where basically chaos there's the law exists. of equivalent exchange yeah yeah but it just it's and you're not necessarily like good or bad you just you channel it for certain ways that being said and this is at least in the games the the end game if you will of the whole thing is that there is kind of like a king bad guy sitting on the other side of the realm. Um, and that's the king of the wild hunt. Uh, and so without getting like super spoilier on that, like this story matters. And I don't think you could have done an accurate representation of like what's driving the magic behind this world without necessarily uh, introducing the king of the wild hunt. And my guess is that's going to be like season three or something. Three, yeah, season three. Like, it's at like that point. You know, yeah. next season, I think they should do hard on the politics, like Mocha was saying, because like King was a full test. Do we even meet him besides the end when he showed up with his army? No. Yes, Just that like, one time. No, no, we, we actually met him in a flashback with, and also met his yeah, mom with his sister, for, too. For three like we, seconds. Yeah, so, we, but we also met him the entire and a lot of a lot of the time in the for, uh, for the Striga episode, too. So we, we oh, we yeah, that was, was talking about. Yeah, so yeah. Full test is like, I think oh, that storyline will be. Oh, when Calanthe's daughter two, married the uh, Sonic the Hedgehog cosplayer? Yep. Yes. Okay. Looked better than the original design. <laughs> yeah. But <laughs> if once once they delve into the wild hunt, they need to further explore the magical abilities of Siri. Yeah. Well, which is yeah. That, like, we're I, just getting I, started with Siri here. Right. So. Yeah. At, they gave her too much time. When I look down at, when I look at the breakdown of like the three major characters that they promoted in the series, I think it was 40% Yennefer, which I think was overdone. I don't think they needed to put so much emphasis on her. I think for sure it didn't need to be a three episode transformation. I think it like one would have been good enough, but I think it was forty percent Yennefer, forty percent Geralt, and twenty percent Siri. When in the subsequent seasons, it's gonna have to be like seventy percent Geralt, thirty percent Siri, or sixty percent Geralt, forty percent Siri, with Yennefer showing up once in a while. See, because, I'm fine because they're yeah. so important. They're such, and like she's growing such an Triss's character. character and stuff like that. I'm fine they because at some point, yeah. because I think that they're destinies are so i don't think they really drove home how significant the Jin episode was um because they're because basically their three destinies are somewhat interwoven yeah. um I, I honestly wish they did less of siri this year because she doesn't really become that that interesting until later on in the story until she gets yeah. older yeah until, they until they take her to care mourn and she becomes a witcher right but then she becomes the fucking wow. witcher 2.0 because she's got crazy magical abilities too right i, I agree so, like i i don't know enough of the story to to say because xyz they should have gotten less but i think given what i saw of siri in this this uh season i think we could have done with less siri and use that time just to bit flush out like other content. Other characters. I also yeah. think that we could have done with less of that blue-eyed wizard dude that was Jennifer's love interest when she was still a hunchback. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I don't know if he's going to be important later oh, on, Balsack. but Balsack? Cut, cut him, cut no, him, cut, yeah, cut him out, and no, use Malsack that time was... to develop Fringilla and the other uh, mages. Yeah, because that guy, what he went off to be an archaeologist. No, I don't he's care talking about, about Istrid, not Malsack. Oh, Istrid. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the, 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 the the purpose behind creating that character. And going back to him later on was to show that the whole Nilfgaard invasion isn't as detrimental as a lot of people consider it to be. Yes, Nilfgaard is trying to conquer the entirety of the realm, but there's also politics behind it, which is, I think it was Blue was saying they should delve further into in season two. Yeah, there's politics behind it where it's like, yeah, we we're here for the eternal flame and for the light. We want that to they're essentially not heretics but they're 
zealots. They're yeah. zealots trying to promote religious their, zealots. Yeah, yeah, religious zealots trying to promote their ideals onto the entirety of the nations. But there's there's civility behind it that you explore further in the games, where it's like you're not just killing monsters; you're doing contracts for Nilf Guardians. You know, they're they're normal people too. There's there's soldiers there that help you out in the background, but they also then need to delve further into. Tamaria and Redania and Skellige and the other nations that it, will eventually have a role to play. In so I yeah. like in I like in uh, Nilfgaard just it's the Empire from Star <laughs> yes. Wars. Yeah. You know they they complete with the swanky armor and everything. I actually like those guys when I was playing the game. Uh, yeah. I, I I always took their quests because they were they paid well. <laughs> in the oh, game, man. does the Nilfgaard armor also look like it's made out of ball sack? No, no, no. <laughs> actually, that that was a that was a super negative for me because the Nilf Guardian armor was Looked badass, unequivocally yeah. the the best. It was just pure black with like gold trim, pretty much for all of it, and it just yeah. was cool. And Citra was just like plain like peasant clothes and stuff, or it was kind of silver white, I guess. The Redanian do the Redanian armor in the games r- crimson with gold inlay. Mm. <laughs> oh no, I'm a Nilf Guard guy. Yeah. I like so, but um, I think uh, talk, y'all bring up yeah. uh, some good, good point. uh, points about the series story. Um, I think overall, like I agree with y'all, the casting is great. Uh, I do think series story kind of uh lacked the most. Uh, it was the most boring. They, I, it felt like they just need to. Re- they were repeating moments with her constantly, just the same type of moments that she runs away, she meets up with people that she has to figure out can i trust them or not and then something happens and she has to run away again she does that like three or four times throughout the whole series and it's all ultimately to lead up to her meeting uh Geralt. and it, it did get a little repetitive a little bit boring they literally uh stick her in a forest for two episodes um and it's um even though i did like the character and everything i think that it was the flattest part of the, of the show but one thing I think the show did really well was the humor and the comic relief. There were lines in the show where I was dying and I was rolling on the floor. Um, especially with uh, whenever Geralt is hanging out with Jaskiar, um, the humor is just <laughs> on point. Uh, when they run into that pan goat creature and he goes, did your mom fuck a snowman? I have not laughed that hard at a show in a long time. Uh, and um, I think that um, alongside him, uh, the actor that plays Jaskier does a great job of bringing that humor. Even though he's a really goofy dude, he's an annoying ass that just hangs around Geralt because he knows he could probably he could probably profit off of the coin that the Witcher gets too. So as he if he hypes up the Witcher, he can probably get some money back on it. And I like that type of like simple relationship, but also it's like gives them opportunities to explore what they can do with these two characters. Uh, but I, I do like that this this show is not keeping itself totally seriously, that it is taking moments to poke fun of itself and poke fun of fantasy as well. And um, the only thing else I needed and I was hoping it was going to happen was just to see roach like Geralt call for roach and then roach to like barrel through a crowd of people and just like break legs and stuff coming to Geralt I, I wonder that would have been hilarious that's actually one of the things that I'm most looking forward to in season two is finding out what happened to roach because uh <laughs> Geralt gets separated from roach during the uh the fall of Sinta or Sintra and then gets like dragged away on a cart lord knows where and I just feel bad because Roach is just out there somebody, somewhere Skyrim. tied to All a pole. All he has pole. to do is whistle for He's him. probably tied That's down. It. He tied them down every time. He's just going to starve to death on that whatever <laughs> no. stump he got tied to. <laughs> no, this is how it works. You whistle for Roach, and Roach just barrels through whatever's in front of him. He'll knock down trees. He'll knock down monsters. It doesn't matter. He'll Anything jump on top of houses, too. Honestly, if Henry Cavill whistled for me, I'd do the same. <laughs> <laughs> Bradley, what else you got before we go over and blew it? <laughs> um... I, I know Blue will probably be, I mean, he's our musical genius, but I'm sure there were some fifth harmonic notes or something in that song that just made it catchy in the ear. And I, there were points where I was like at work and people were singing that song and I was just like, please stop. And then I would hear it in my head. I'm like, oh God, now I'm doing it too. So why is that Apparently, song so damn catchy, Blue? 
apparently that dude he recorded it and then he was like thought nothing of it then two months later it, he just started singing it randomly in his car like that's that's apparently how it works is just it just nestles in there and just explodes i freaking love that song it makes me want to run through walls um weirdly enough so uh, you know i don't me know if that's like, a good thing or a bad thing no it's great it's like the kool-aid man um <laughs> the uh that's a bad here's your, thing <laughs> here's your music fact for the day uh you know how most most things are built in fours you know twos and fours um the uh, toss a coin the verses are sixes oh, and six, it's not like time? no it's not six eight like six measures so it's normally oh, like wow. You know, one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, four, two, three, four, repeat. This one's like one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, four, two, three, four, five, two, three, four, six, two, three, four, repeat. It just, it's weird. No, it's no, because six, four would be like one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two. Oh, it's four, six. No, it's, it's, it's six measures of four, four. Oh, six measures of four. So, but like, usually it's like, Four oh, okay. So it's four, 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 but it's just six measures long. It's just two, two times two extra too long. measures. Yeah, it's that's weird. weird. Why? I, I was just like, <laughs> all right, that's that's awkward, but it works. I freaking love it. Um, yeah, that character Jaskier was like the most annoying little pissant, but it really worked. Like I felt annoyed by him so many times, but I'm like, this is exactly what they're going for just like this annoying person that has no right standing on his own um and that he's just like lucky that Geralt just kind of likes him for no reason in particular right they never really go into that he's just kind of there and he's like willing to defend him um yeah no I love that character and his songs are killer that's exactly how it is in the game though he's he plays such an important role in the in the game well the previous games in the current game, he plays such an important role when it comes to trying to find Siri. But, like, the background that you get in those missions that you're trying to find Dandelion or Dan DeLeon, <laughs> a.k.a. Uh, Yaskier, the background that you get from those interactions all comes in the style where it's like Geralt has had to save him from countless situations. He's had to save him from monsters. He's had to save him from gambling debts. He's had to save him after he's uh, fucked some prince's like lover or something like that. He's had to save him in every <laughs> circumstance imaginable. And I think it it, mel- it mends well in the show where it's this is the uh, burdening relationship that you're seeing at, coming to a head that it's starting. And then where they go from there, it's just going to be more uh, yes, gear getting himself into shit. And then Geralt having to save him again, which, again, they should do further where they try to explore these characters even more. He, he's a good contradiction to the type of character that Geralt is, where Geralt is not, he's speaking as few words as possible, and Yaskier is saying anything that can possibly pop into his head at any given time. They need that, con- they need the contrast. Yeah, I did. I did appreciate yes, uh, yes, Kier, for the same reasons that you and, and Blewett just highlighted. He was so annoying, and but so obviously meant to be annoying that I was like, I have to just be really happy that they're getting this emotion out of me because this is obviously what they wanted to do. Um, but like, I what perfect casting because like that guy has such a punchable face, and <laughs> I, I feel like that does like fifty percent of the work <laughs> for his character. <laughs> yeah, and speaking of just like. Um some perfect casting uh, the actress they got for queen calanthe um mm. it kind of was like a detriment to series story because she was basically stealing every single scene she was in yeah. she was great. uh calanthe was a total badass and it was really cool to see her like leading her army out to battle her armor was badass as well but just like the wisdom that she was like trying to evoke on the siri even though it was like a firm hand it does make sense and it does show like she's a queen that is able to run the whole gamut even though she is a very stern queen as well she does mean good and i i hope they find ways to kind of just do flashbacks back to queen calanthe to give this actress more to do 
Oh, they the next will. Season. They won't. They will, but they won't tell us, and we'll have to figure it out ourselves. But I want to have <laughs> it like be like a story that's told. Like, did you ever hear the story of the battle and such and such where Queen Calanthe smited this person? I would love to see like her she just ever... charging into battle every other episode. Did or she, something. she tell you uh, Maggie the Frog, the story of Maggie the Frog? She did not. No, no. she was by far uh, my MVP. Even. Well, no, Geralt was obviously the MVP. Uh, Geralt's abs are probably a close second place. His biceps, the third. The chest hair. Biceps, that his pecs, yeah. Every fucking sud, every bubbly every sud that sep- went down his chest. Uh, Yennefer oh, before man. transformation was my MVP. She yeah. good. Uh, but wow. but Calanthe was like certainly up there. And certainly characters that I wasn't expecting to like. You know, I that one stood out. Uh, also, she was in Game of Thrones. She was the one who gave uh, Cersei the prophecy oh no way yeah yep calanthe was i don't know if i'm in the minority here for this but uh i think that (laughs) like that scene where calanthe walks in young calanthe walks in and like covered in blood wearing armor and and has grabs the cup and screams beer was an extreme turn on she was so (laughs) fun in that scene i got a boner i can't lie (laughs) but that's just because you I had a residual do. one from Geralt. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Residual boner. You right. actually can't. That's going to be my new band name. Uh, <laughs> residual residual boners. boners. There should have um, been a warning screen that said, if this show has your penis erect for more than four episodes, call it You can't binge it. Otherwise, you have to go to the doctor's office. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. Yes. Uh, yeah, Blue. now I'm just thinking about... No. Blue, what else you um, got for... Uh, Actors and characters. Actors and characters. I've heard of both of those things. I'm not too too clear on it. Um, I love uh, Renfrey. I thought that was such and a story. cool... What? And the story. What? Don't proceed. Don't just oh, just, yeah, words. let me talk. Uh, <laughs> Ren- Renfrey was such a great, interesting way to just, like start the whole series off and really show like what that character is about. Um, the Butcher of Blaviken scene. Like I wasn't expecting such cool sword fighting from a show like this for some reason like i don't know why but i i just thought like all right there might be there might be blood but i feel like they're gonna cheap out on the choreography to get the blood (laughs) and they they didn't you know they didn't do the big battle as well as as maybe game of thrones did like you know that was kind of like just a generic sacking scene but like the the butcher of blaviken scene was awesome and i really can't wait to see them uh, go further um yeah no that was that was sweet for me uh plus her saucy character was appreciated um yeah and i th- that was the big thing that stood out i just i i hope people don't get turned away by the pace because they're setting up stuff that i think can really pay off in the long run and we've kind of talked about this for a while but um I think that they can bring back things that they're doing right now very easily and explain them later on um, and kind of make the, the whole series worthwhile, which is like the anti Game of Thrones because Game of Thrones explained a whole bunch of things and then never touched about on it again. Yeah. And I hate that, it. It was all, it was all conjecture and build up no. for season after season after season. And then only like three or four times you had the payoff. Yeah. With like the red wedding and shit like that. Or uh the battle of whatever I can't remember the, the bastards. Name. Yeah. Battle of the bastards, all that shit. That's the payoff that you got. And then the last three seasons was build up, build up, build up, fucking big ass letdown. Yeah. Yeah. Mike is no longer friends with Game of Thrones. Mike is friends of The Witcher. Yeah. <laughs> Which Mike? Cool Mike or ugly Mike? <sighs> We're one and the same. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, st- I still think they gave way too much time to Yennefer. Mike is just a Doppler for the other Mike. You know, I think that they gave him or gave her. I uh, just farted. That's definitely ending up on tape. Um, the I think that they gave her an appropriate amount as long as they taper, because I think that her story is a little harder to like just drop in the middle of, which I I think. You know, I agree with Mocha that Fringilla should have been set up more. I almost wish that they. I get, yeah, I get, I, I agree. You should have been ten episodes because then it would have been it would have been spaced out because you can't necessarily cut time from your main character. But like her story is weird enough that you gotta somewhat know that backstory 
And then when she pops up in and out from the remainder of the story, you kind of get where that character is coming from. Yeah. Rather than what they did with Triss, where Triss just kind of like appears. And when she appears next season for like a major storyline, you're not going to quite know why she's important. Whereas now when Yennefer shows up, like she just, she can only be in it. She might only be in it for like five to 10 minutes, but you're like, Oh cool. I know this character and know where, where it's coming from. And I know the reason why this like seems important, but you have to do the legwork in season one uh, for it to pay off later. Yeah. I don't think I needed less episodes of Yennefer, but I just needed more uh, like diversity of what was focused on in the Yennefer episodes. I think it was like the Yennefer episodes were just a big miss and read in developing the the Brotherhood and the other people within the uh uh Astora, I believe it's called. Way too much way too much tortured soul going on. Yeah, yeah we got it. As soon as they showed that she was like a hunchback with the with the messed up jaw, it. like we got it. Her life sucks. I, I watched the hunchback. <laughs> She's two hundred years old. I get it. But the, <laughs> okay. Uh but then <laughs> <laughs> take them taking the her the ability away for her to bear a child and that sort of shifts her motivations to kind of get that back. I, I agree with you, Rob. I feel like this story arguably was you said forty forty. I think this was like a, a sixty, um a sixty thirty, sixty being Jennifer more yeah. so than Geralt. Yeah. But um, Geralt and has less to grow. Yeah, but I, it's not about Girl less to grow. To cool. I'd rather you just show me more. Like more he them. is going to mm. be like yeah. clearly, we need to have him on screen more and less of Yennefer, or or to the point where it almost seems as though Yennefer's character was supposedly what Ciri's character is, but it seems like they hyped up Yennefer so much so that in the second season, if they reduce this to the 10, 15 percent that I think it will be. Everybody's going to be really frustrated why it was so much in season one. So I'm super curious how they balance that out they go to because she was in so much. I wonder yeah, for, yeah, exactly. for, for the people who played the games uh, and even and also maybe if you had a story, was Yennefer as central of the character? Like, was she more important than Triss and all those other characters that we get to know? Or she's more important kinda, than Triss? She is yeah. like a step ahead of Triss. Yeah. Yeah. She's, she's also like a mother figure to Siri as Geralt is a father figure to her. She's yeah. like she's like the main quest and Triss shows up in a lot of side quests. Yeah. But you could yeah. have sex with both of them. Yes. Oh, word? At and the then, same yeah. time? Oh yeah. Well, I don't know there's about a, that, but there's like, a lot of sex. In. But like, you have sex with Triss in a watchtower, and it's fucking awesome. I'm not. Gonna, I'm gonna play. <laughs> it is gonna, honest. Gonna, it's honestly beautiful. Yeah, I'm gonna go back to a previous save file just so I can do that mission again <laughs> and do it all over again. <laughs> nice, uh, Mocha. Do you have anything else to share before I toss it to Rob? Um, not too much outside of what we've talked about so far, like in terms of just my, you know, the pros and cons or what I think of it. What I do think is worth talking about is uh, outside of this, our critique of the show itself, uh, I'm just thinking about just how big of a success, success this has been for, for Netflix. Um, you know, Netflix for a while, it seems at least like they've been really searching for some big franchise that they can like overdevelop to hell over time. And Witcher is definitely going to be it. Uh, it's, it's, if it isn't, then it's definitely on track to be their most successful show of all time. Uh, apparently, they released numbers recently that said that 75 million uh, households cho- uh, watched The Witcher during its first four weeks. And to put That's that into... a lot of Henry Cavill bathtubs. It's a lot of bathtub scenes. <laughs> Not enough. <laughs> but, like, but to put that into perspective, like the, uh, the Crown had 40 million viewers. Um, wow. where, you know, uh, let's see, what, what's the, you know, some other popular show that had- I think Stranger, it broke things, Stranger things. things. It definitely broke like Stranger Things, yeah. Million. Yeah, like and so it's been incredibly successful. And they announced recently as well that aside from doing season two in 2021, they're also before uh, going to do a uh, Witcher anime movie. I'll and it's going to be an anime I, I, style. That news, that news broke like today, I think. Yeah, it's, this is very fresh. Hop the presses. There's a mm. Witcher anime that's coming, and it's going to be a movie that fleshes out more content of the story that I think falls before the series starts or is between this series and the next se- season. I don't know. It's going to give us more, more, more content, that's more cool. adventures. But they're clearly like getting ready to dig in for this. So I hope everyone who's listening to this enjoyed the show because we're about to get a lot more of it. Yeah. And I am so so ready to to watch this uh, anime. I believe yeah. that the people the that the announced development studio who is going to be uh, doing it is uh, Moyer Animation. Which for anybody who doesn't know, they're the same people who did Avatar, 
and Voltron. Uh, so they're a fantastic animation company that does really, really, really good quality content. Uh, so I'm, I'm super excited for it. Oh, okay. Uh, Rob, anything else you got for Acted's character and story? Uh, I'm, I don't know. I feel like we touched upon a lot of it. I think they did a lot of great cast. They were 95% th- two thumbs up for all the casting. I think Triss was the only issue that I saw. And they fixed that with a bright red, red wig. Or they just dye her hair bright red. Then it's a hundred percent. I don't care. Just you know, give her more fucking showtime. If they um, don't do either, then it's okay at at minimum. That's yeah. about it. Like it's it's just a letdown, you know, in hindsight, where they could have done so much more. And like we were saying, when it comes to subsequent seasons, they have to taper back on Yennefer, and they have to put more focus on Geralt and Ciri and the relationship that forms between them. And the importance of the character of Siri, especially if they if they're going fucking seven seasons out and they wanna, you know, eclipse what's going on in the game and the books, and the wild hunt gets introduced, Siri is the main character at that point. Yeah. And that's where they need to, you know, put more focus on. I think you know, I had my opinions coming in thinking that Yennefer took way too much of the spotlight, but I do agree when you guys say like they kind of needed to do that see you know seeing where they plan on going forward with the franchise so i enjoyed the show so much so that i bought the video game and it kind of came at the perfect time for me because i was dog sitting for my sister who was out of town when my girlfriend was supposed to be dog sitting for my sister but she had to go out for her mom's birthday so i'm fucking stuck there dog sitting the whole time with nothing to do my sister's house didn't have anything besides netflix so i watched the entirety of the show in one sitting and then i bought the game immediately after and i'm 50 hours in and it's fucking incredible is this the same dog that shits the floor every time you watch it no, dude, that's my dog, okay? And my dog is a fucking piece of shit, and he pisses all over the place still. Um, do you guys remember, regarding going back to Witcher, do you guys remember the absolute internet shitstorm that came when they first released uh, an image of Henry Cavill with the wig from, like, a preliminary yeah, uh, it was like like a, development point? It's yeah. like costume test or something. Yeah, it's like a general costume test, and people flipped out on the internet. They were like, this, sh- this show's going to be terrible. This wig looks awful. Harry Cavill does. it's terrible to play Geralt. It did. I mean... At the time, it, yeah, but that was yeah. also not like a finished product. And people, yeah, I like, know, but, but, like, but here's the thing. It. But even if you look at it now, and guys, I, I know, but like, reduce your um, biasness. Like, this show was set up to fail that I think they yeah. knocked it out of the park. Dude, you're 100% yeah. right. There's it was everything it was... wrong about the show that they were like, nope, we're not going to let this fail. We've seen so many people, even Charlie Hunnam, play fucking King Arthur. That was horrible. We've yeah, seen... but he looked so, so good doing it. Uh, yeah, so but dumpy. everything about that movie was <laughs> terrible, right? So I, I, I hear you, Mokin. I'm not shitting on The Witch by any means. I was just, I'm blown away, and I think this has exceeded everybody's expectations, which means that I'm always nervous for the next thing, season two. I'm always nervous about because it was like, man, I don't think they knew how popular this is going to be. So yeah. I really hope, and I now trust the showrunners, keep it like this. I, I think is, I, I'm really curious um, now thinking this through, uh, Rob. I'm curious if they're going to take this approach of sort of Sound and Fury book, of if they have different chapters, right, or different seasons that's going to focus on a different main character. If Yennefer was season one, and because of her being her mage and she never aged because she's basically going through time, if that's how, I don't know, but this is just like my theory, um, if that's how they're preparing propelling the story in season one if season two is going to be either Geralt or Ciri or whomever another main character if how they present the story to us is going to be even more linear or different or like maybe a POV I'm not sure I'm curious to see if they're going to change how they're going to present the story to us because I don't think you can continue to keep doing the time skips because it's going to probably frustrate a lot of people so I think what was a huge success in the first season came down to like monster of the week for half of it where it's like, I'm the witcher. I have to go make coin. I'm going to go hunt this monster. And that was like six episodes out of the eight was a good 
summation yeah. of that time. And that's like a that's a very successful formula when it comes to a, when it comes to long standing shows. Like you look at shows like Supernatural. The show went on for fifteen seasons. That's a monster of the week procedural show with overarching, you know, plots behind it. And then I also forgot to mention this, but I got back into the X Files recently, and that's all the X Files is. That's yeah. monster of the week. I those think- were even like some of the most clever stories, like that. Right. The Butcher Blaviken's fantastic. Uh, the Striga story is fantastic. And th- those are all those are all open the front page at the beginning of the episode, close that chapter at the yeah. end of the episode. The Dijin was fantastic, and it actually set up something more for that relationship between right. Geralt and Yennefer. And this is why I like a lot of the dialogue, a lot of the script in this actual story in this TV show. Because if you go back and watch the first episode, he's talking to a a little girl that's just mentioning all these monsters and if they're real and if they fought them. And also Yaskier also brings up if these things are real, if he's fought them. We haven't even, we don't even know in episode one what a freaking Striga is. And they're already talking about it. I think it it definitely sets up that, oh, this is small little uh, uh, bits and pieces of information that is going to have some sort of payoff. I I really like why they needed to have this nonlinear storytelling because it it tends to be a little bit more uh, interesting to watch the uh, the show. So I'm I'm really glad that they have, um, I, I don't know the name of the term, but there's dialogue in the show that that's just thrown there mess messily. It's actually there for everything. For everything reason. there is important. Yeah, exactly. Like it's it's, set it's not just be... expo- exposition sort of thing. Right. It's like right. it's for a reason. Yeah, it's set to be explored further on, which is why I think I, for season two, Blue was saying it's probably going to be political based, which makes sense because where they are currently with Nilf- Nilfgaard invading, you know, as much of the central of the part of the country as they can, it makes sense that it would take a more overarching political viewpoint. But there's clever ways of going about it. Like what take, for instance, when you're playing the game and you go do a mission for Tamaria or Redania, who currently are, who support Nilfgaard, but they're not like given up to Nilfgaard. You know what I'm saying? Right. Or then you'd fully go do a quest for Nilfgaard. I think that they keep the formula of monster of the week where it's, Geralt's going to a Nilfgaardian general and their general has lost a platoon of soldiers to a fucking group of Nakars out in the woods somewhere. What? Uh, so when he gets attacked, what? Uh, N-E-K-K-A-R-S. I don't know how to, I don't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> oh, there was a hard R in there. Okay, okay. Bob. <laughs> okay. So at the end, at the end of the first season. Could have named a werewolf, know. a vampire, yeah. a drowner. Could have said so dragon. At the oh, end of the first uh, season, hag. that's what he gets attacked by. Yeah. Swamp creature. Nope. Yeah. Well, I, I, know I know better uh, than the hunting Neckar. You get your fingers bit. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we're going to cut the stream on that now. <laughs> So let's um, move into our we'll, we'll oh, final last thing thoughts. Well, one, yeah. one, one, one last thing. Yeah. So I think if they do that formula again, where it's they're doing something for each faction, but he's completely ambiguous and agnostic to the whole political stuff, I think it sets up again for the dialogue in the background for the overarching political view of the season. So I think that that's the way that the show continues to be successful. Monster of the Week with a political background behind it. I would love I, that. I I also love the fact that they didn't like they didn't go overboard on monster fights in this one. Like the Strigo was amazing, but there's some like really big monsters that that are kind of classic in the the game that he doesn't touch. And like I I respect them because it it'd be really easy for him to fight a werewolf in season 1. You know, and like really easy to be like, oh, check this out. Like, it's the Witcher, guys. Here, here you go. Um, and I really respect that they did and, and that they could save that for a bigger episode in the future. Also, jumping way back to what Warren said, uh, this show is being billed as the Game of Thrones killer. Like, this is mm-hmm. the, they, Netflix promoted this like, you will never think about Game of Thrones ever again after watching it, which, the Wheel of Time. 
The Wheel of Time is going to be the Game of Thrones killer. I'm calling. Yeah, I don't. I don't Game of Thrones will be the Game of Thrones killer. Well, Well, Game Game of Thrones killed itself. Yeah, that's more suicide. (laughs) But um, the I I don't quite think it's at that point. But I I do think that Netflix did know what they had in the show um, because they were pushing it in that way. That was like four conversations ago, and I don't know if anyone remembers it, but yeah, I do, yeah, and I yeah, wanted yeah. to get that point It was when Ward in. was saying it was a fucking softball that should have been, like, crushed out of the park. They, yeah. Like they, they were setting it up to be shot down, <sighs> yeah. but in reality, it was like a T-ball. Yeah, they no, they... set the baseball on the tee. And Netflix knew what they were doing. It's like when Mr. Burns threw the opening pitch at a Springfield Adams game, and he just goes, Ugh. <laughs> And it goes yeah, like he two feet. A strike, but he throws a strike. And yeah, it's fucking crazy. So let's move into our last thing: <laughs> thoughts and conclusions. Rob, would you recommend the show? If so, what's something that you may tell the listeners, watchers, readers of our show? What's one piece of sort of other media that you'll tell people to, to go check out before they take a look at uh, Witcher season one and season two? So I. I absolutely suggest anybody goes to watch a show. This is one of the best forms of media I've consumed in a while. Like very few shows have gotten me to sit there and binge the entirety of it in one sitting. Granted, I, it was the perfect place at the perfect time in the perfect scenario that it came out that weekend that I had to dog sit and I had absolutely fucking nothing else to do. But otherwise, if I were to just be at my house watching it, I would have binged the entire thing immediately anyway. It's a, a 9.5 out of 10 recommendation for me. It's something that I think everybody who is a fan of high fantasy needs to watch. I think it's anybody who's a fan of the books or the video games absolutely needs to watch. And if you're going into a blind, like a lot of people already did, I went into a blind. I never played the uh, games beforehand. I never read the books beforehand, but I have a, a pretty extensive history in, you know, high fantasy stuff. Um, it's easy enough to consume, but if you want to prepare for it beforehand, I think it's worth – I don't think – you definitely don't need to read the books. You don't need to play the games beforehand, but trust me, you're going to want to play the games afterwards. I think it's worth going on YouTube and just watching like a, like those 45-minute breakdowns of everything you need to know from book one to three or everything – the main – story from video game one to three or one to two rather because three is absolutely worth playing too but i think that's what you should do you don't need it you definitely don't need to do any of the research beforehand but it Mm. might help with some of the like acknowledging where the characters are you know in each episode what these monsters represent like we we went into great detail about the striga there's extensive background to why that why that monster was created and I think it's it's worth having a little bit of a background knowledge going into it, but you absolutely don't need to. Cool. Yep. It's it's the show is incredible. It's worth watching for anybody. Rila? Uh yeah, I'm right there uh, with uh, Doctor Bob. It is an amazing uh, TV show. It's also the best video game adaptation of anything we've seen. Um, and I really love that one thing about this is that. One thing that made me actually fall in love with the video game was just how much the mythology is very, very built on top of this Polish culture and that it's very specifically to that culture. Uh, But I also like that they weren't afraid to make the cast diverse because of that. And I know there was like a video game that came out last year that got into a bit of an uproar because it was set into, I think it was also set in Poland. It was like very accurate to medieval times. And people got, people Kingdom got deliverance. Yeah, people got up in arms because the character selector didn't have like dark skin tones or anything. They'd say, "Well, this is medieval Poland. I mean, you're just gonna see a bunch of white people at that time," which probably was the case, to be honest. But since this is a fantasy, and even though it does have that Polish culturalism to it, they still are able to bring out these characters with a diverse cast and still make it work and show that, yeah, you can make that type of thing work. It's almost like they did a Hamilton in, <laughs> on the Switcher as well. Um, but uh, but the songs are better in this. <laughs> I'm joking. Okay, thank you. Yeah, 
but along with the witcher i think netflix is also doing a lot of good with fantasy right now so i think along with the witcher check out the dark crystal age of resistance it is amazing as well so definitely check that out if you are enjoying fantasy or if you've never enjoyed uh ever never watched a fantasy show before i still think this is actually a good entry point for people that are looking to get into fantasy as well mocha yeah in regards of its flaws this is as brylan said a very very strong uh adapt- attempt to adapt a story that was adapted from another story i think that it's really easy for these things to get you know uh, diluted uh, with each new stage but I felt like this was a really, a re- from someone who hasn't read the book and from someone who's only played the games to a, at a minimum extent, it felt really authentic. Like what I was seeing on screen felt like it was coming off out of, out of those worlds. And I think that that can be really easy to miss when you're trying to please everyone that could possibly be in a, in a viewing audience for, for TV. Um, the, you know, the characters were great. Um, Henry Cavill, as we all mentioned, is extremely sexy, but so is Yennefer, so is Calanth. There is a lot of good eye candy around, even for those people who have uh, poor taste and aren't looking to this show just for Henry Cavill's hairy pecs. All that aside, aside though, you should definitely watch this show. Um, this is also a rare instance where I feel like it might be beneficial for somebody to have the fact that the stories are happening anachronistically spoiled for them. I think that's actually like a better way to go into it if you're not if you don't know anything about this show um but that being said definitely give it a shot um and get on the train now because netflix is going to dig in their heels with this show we've got the anime coming we've got season two and you can bet your ass there's going to be more to come after that so get on the train now mocha already ordered his Geralt uh, plushie oh yeah it I is got my body pillow. anatomically correct <laughs> i got my body pillow dude it has seen some action <laughs> Uh, I cuddle with it all the time. Blew it. I want to make <laughs> a trigger with him. Uh, what's the... Uh, is it like a bottle burn or something? Hang on. Uh, I think I know what you're talking let's sing, about. Let's sing Tussle Coin to your Witcher while Blue It searches Wikipedia for something. Oh, I mean, I can also note the fact that uh, Netflix is taking on the mantle of doing a Resident Evil franchise which is going to be insane to see what they can do with that. But they got the Legend of Zelda now. They have Resident Evil. Uh, I made Winter. the prediction. They got Castlevania. Castlevania, Yeah, Castlevania is incredible. I haven't That's seen incredible, it yet. But, uh, incredible it's anime. Yeah, it's really good. And season three is coming out uh, as, as on its way. Oh, cool. Yeah. That was um, another one I binged in one night, too. Netflix is getting the, uh, the Pokemon Mewtwo movie remake that they did recently, and that looks yeah. really good. They're not getting Studio Ghibli, though. Well, Disney yeah, has that. Exactly. I'm sure we'll. I'm sure we'll get a Ghibli tab on the uh, on Disney Plus sooner or later because Disney yeah. owns the, the the rights to Ghibli. We got uh, overseas Ghibli. Ghibli. Here. So my joke that I wanted to make earlier, I want to make a botchling with Henry Cavill. Oh my god! <laughs> but it's... yeah, but are you gonna are you gonna turn it into a blubberkin afterwards? Or are you gonna kill it? I'm gonna. Give oh, I'll be blubberkin over Henry Cavill. Okay. Okay. Never mind. I for like any- make you a bloody baron. <laughs> yeah, for anyone wow. who doesn't wow. know, for, for anyone who doesn't know, a botchling is um in a similar to a strigo where it's an aborted fetus that dies be- outside what? of like a wed lust. Yeah. And then uh the the bo- what the botchling does is it feeds off of pregnant women and it kills them. And then you, there's two ways to go about it. There, it's a main quest in uh, the third game for the Bloody Baron. You either uh, convince the Baron to accept and love the Botchling, which is this gigantic uh, deformed baby that walks around with giant teeth that eats pregnant women. <laughs> so you have to convince the Baron to love this uh, aborted child that turned into a monster, and it turns into a blubberkin, which protects the estate and the family that chose to then love the aborted child. It is 
fucked up. Man, I just looked <laughs> up what a bla- bla- what a botchkin or botchling looks like, and that is not yeah. something I want to look. It's not great. Uh, so actually, that's that's one good thing. So I overall really really like this show. Um, definitely coming back for season two. Um, I need to beat Fallen Order because I really want to play Witcher three now. Oh, um, <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm just so far behind. Um, the the one thing that you raise a good point that I think they didn't quite get is that like most of the missions in the game start with like Geralt not knowing too much. And then he's, he's actually a really good detective because he's got these like super senses to an extreme. Mm -hmm. He's like a really, really good detective. And I think that they could delve into that a little bit harder uh, next season that he's most. Yeah, Yeah, he is, but he's Batman. Yeah. In medieval. So he's the Batman of medieval. This yeah. Realm. And it'd be cool. Cause like, you know, TV, you could certainly do his like super hearing, super smelling like pretty easily. You know, I think they alluded to it, but not as much as it, it could have been. They need more um, signs than Ord going off. So yeah. I mean, the entirety yeah. of the yeah. Demon Slayer show is based on the fact that he smells good or it smells well. So uh, I feel like they could Demon definitely Slayer. do that for Witcher. Mm, yeah. Demon Slayer. Also 10 out of 10 must watch. Heard it here yeah. first. <laughs> the first time anyone's ever talked about the show Demon Slayer uh, I mean, was right here on the Down in Front podcast. <laughs> the first Breaking news. Ever talk about it. <laughs> 10 out of 10 must watch. Uh, also, um, the uh, if you're looking to get into stuff like this, just go do yourself a favor and watch The Lord of the Rings again. Uh, I know you've seen it, so just watch it again. It, to me, that is the, the pinnacle of this type of fantasy is The Lord of the Rings. Should our viewers start with the second the hobbit movie and then no. work their way out oh, those don't exist no, no. <laughs> they're Just, fine those are fine movies no. outside of the lord of the rings no. if they had nothing to do with the lord of the rings i'll watch them watch the extended editions because the theatrical cuts are not that good I, that is i can agree with that as well yeah. uh i mean i i follow up with everything that uh, everyone said mainly you rob and blew it i'm not saying brylin or mocha you guys are wrong of course relax um uh definitely watch it definitely go check it out i think it's a very easy watch i think you'll definitely kind of enjoy it especially for a lot of this more video game-esque sort of things that you may not necessarily know um my buddy who actually hated it because he didn't like the fact that henry cavill just says hmm a lot (laughs) and it was really stupid because a lot of his hmms and grunts that he was making was actually really actually really fucking good acting of a way to have um it's not quite silent dialogue but a lot of those were all different and they're they they were saying and kind of at least kind of progressing the story there's a lot that i'm just blown away by this actual show so definitely go check it out um i'll toss it up a little bit different um i'd say go check out something more high fantasy like uh sort of online sort of first season um because that's also going to get whoa Watch your mouth. Um, watch your mouth. Um, that's something I really enjoyed, but just for you to kind of get an understanding of sort of not quite what The Witcher is, but battles and mages and things like that, I think you might enjoy it. Cool. And with that, we have been the Down to Front Podcast. Thanks so much for tuning in. Thanks so much for joining. Thank you so much, Dr. Bobbert, for hanging out with us. Dr. Bob, where can people find more of your work on the interwebs? So I am uh, Dr. Bob of Wicked Good Gaming. Uh, we have a website called wickedgoodgaming.com. We put up a bunch of content for uh, majority video game stuff, but we also, I tag into a bunch of movies and TV shows, uh, a lot of horror, horror theme stuff that I promote on the website. Uh, you could follow our social medias at Wicked Good Gaming on everything except for Twitter. It's at Wicked Good Games. I actually created, I recreated uh, my Twitter account today for the first time in <laughs> five years, I think, maybe more than that. And my personal Twitter is at uh, WGG Bert, and you can follow me there. I just basically <laughs> just talk shit, I guess, uh, retweet my own stuff from my own other Twitter account. Makes sense. I'll post but dog I, pics or something. I could do that too. I get my dog yeah. shitting on my floor. I could post that <laughs> at, at any given time. Um, you could check us out at youtube.com backslash wicked good gaming. Uh, if you guys want, I could put this recording up on YouTube as well. You guys can put it up on yours as well. I'm currently live with the boys at twitch.tv backslash wicked good gaming. 
Where else? Oh, you can also listen to our Not Another Gaming podcast on all podcast platforms. I was, and... like, I was about to say, like, you didn't mention that, but okay. Yeah. Yeah, people should and, definitely uh, tune into that. Best, best gaming yeah. podcast out there. No, oh, gaming way. podcast on Spotify. And um, I think that covers everything. Well, yeah, we're on all social medias. Find them down at uh, Dan DeLeon's uh, hot dog cart <laughs> yeah. on Thursdays. Boston Commons. <laughs> Catch me getting a nice hot dog at Dan DeLeon's hot dog cart. Uh, Brylan, where can people find more of your work on the internet? Uh, you can find me invoking the law of surprise on Twitter, but for some reason, uh, when I do that at Brylan, B-R-I-L-U-N-D, the cops always show up. Uh, but you can also find me posting many movie and TV reviews on Instagram at I am Brylan. Recently, I put up my top three games of 2019 and my top three movies of 2019 as well. So check those out. And we got some things uh, coming up soon. We're going to put up a review of Uncut Gems, and there's also going to be one for Watchmen as well. Uh, Boca, how about you? Um, yeah, you guys can find me on Twitter where I post videos of myself tossing coins to the homeless uh, at Mocha Mike Li, as the Lord intended. Fun fact, those coins are just leftover euros from my trip abroad. So uh, good luck getting a hot meal with that, asshole. Ah, oh, damn. <laughs> damn. <laughs> um, you cannot, unfortunately, find me at Mocha Mike because the person who owns that username was killed by some like Blumpkin or some sort of weird monster. <laughs> Before Watch you can one. give me the password, so I can't get that going anymore. So Mocha Mike LI it is. You can also find me on Instagram at Mocha Mike where I post my photography work and on Medium at Mocha Mike where I post some longer form reviews of the stuff we talk about here. You should Google what a Blumpkin is right now. Killed by uh, a Blumpkin is my Blue, fan name. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Blue, where can people find more of your work and what you got coming up? Yeah, you can find us at My News Music or My News Band on most major platforms. Uh... Yeah, we're, we're doing stuff. Uh, we recorded a song the other day. It's about child brides. Um, that's not a joke. It's a, <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, uh, you know, no one will ever listen to it. Uh, but because uh, I'm never going to post it. Um, anyways, you can also uh, find us at Jesse's Van of Surprises. Um, he has enough interactions with the law. So I think it's it's topical to this you can also email him at jesse in a hot tub at gmail.com. Mm. Uh, we actually may have used that one before. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's. <laughs> you also though. find Jesse at uh, King's Richards Fair uh, the weekend of February 25th. <laughs> He'll be the damsel in distress. <laughs> Uh, check out more of our work at downinfrontpockets.com where we have our video teasers, live episodes. We have our last calls. Lots of really, really juicy, good content that's going to be on there. Hopefully, once the Wicked Good Gaming bros kind of like us, we can kind of put their stuff on their website, but they don't like us yet. But we'll, we'll get there. Um, we're Wait, just... hold on. Are you, are you saying you want us to acquire you? Okay, sure. <laughs> What's Quiet. your offer? <laughs> no. Hey, we we uh, got to get some lawyers up in here now. I'll offer you a shirt. <laughs> we're still get, waiting to get acquired by Arizona. Arizona iced tea. <laughs> yeah, that'll be that. Hey, Arizona iced tea, make it happen. Prices on the can. Although I did have to spend two dollars for Arizona iced tea, I did not see the ninety nine cents on this can. So I think they may be changing their um, design up. It was kind of it's kind of a bummer. You can't but, support those business. You can't support those business practices anymore. I know <laughs> it just tastes good. Check out more of our work at downinfrontpodcast.com. Uh, we're also going to be on Twitter at underscore DAFP. We're on Facebook, facebook.com slash downinfrontpodcast. All of our music is going to be on SoundCloud. So, and Blue it is going to be creating us a brand new theme. So, super pumped about that. I am. The- <laughs> I am. <laughs> His face is like, what? Yeah. No, I'm not. Uh, check us out. If you want to actually go and support us, consider become a Patreon, patreon.com slash downinfrontpodcast. We have a Reddit where we actually will be posting more of our side reviews. We got a new sort of section called Beyond the Pod that's going to be on there. So I will be posting some more stuff that's going to be on there. That's Reddit at downinfrontpockets.com. Thanks so much for everybody. I really, really appreciate your time kind of listening and tuning in. Rob, as always, we thoroughly appreciate you being our guest. We always have a hell of a lot of fun. So I don't know the next time you're on there, but I hope it's going to be sometime soon.
Thank you for having me on, guys. Of course. Thanks. Thank I appreciate you, Dr. it Bob. so much. It would have been sick to be on for the Halloween episode, but you know what? <laughs> Fuck it. I guess I won't be invited back. You gotta keep, I feel like you got to say that Come back for time. Saw. <laughs> <laughs> I won't. If, if we're doing the Saw, you're there, bro. You I am there. not going to see that fucking yes, movie. Yes, I don't care who's doing yes, it. Yes, you will. Will you come back if it's Saw in space? If it's like a futuristic no. fa- Saw movie? We're going to oh, like force you to watch it like Bird Box. Well, Bob, you might, uh, you might um, be excited about our next movie we'll review because the next movie we're going to review since this podcast was so hot we might as well keep it going hot uh stars charlie hunnam with a big beard mm-hmm. and he's in a suit he kind of looks like conor mcgregor uh we are going to be reviewing guy Ritchie's the gentleman do it not a fan of him in suits feel it just doesn't feel natural oh, just way too much covering up those abs Who? Is there <laughs> a lot of, are you a fan of him and you uh, well, you know, I top. would, I would not <laughs> protest. I guess it depends on which hole. <laughs> Take it. it doesn't matter. Man. Good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs> yes. I do that, uh, somebody. I can. Uh, uh, I'll, yeah. I'll, um, Feel free I'll to post download, it. Do you want to put? I, I mean, I can put it on my. I can put it on our YouTube. My I hour. can send it to you guys too. So I'll. It's gonna probably gonna take like several hours to download. So <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> so I'll do it probably either overnight or tomorrow at some point. Okay. But yeah, just yeah. Uh, bother me.